start our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. by recessing our board meeting because we have um, a public hearing on our proposed budgets for 2022 tax rates tax levies our um, CPS plan and bus replacement plan these are all part of the normal and routine um, but very important yearly items that we thought we went over this last meeting correct in August I was able to yes and then um, so this is the time for the public if they have any questions, concerns, other comments. Um, is there anything, Mrs. Vance, that you wanted Mr. Vanderweel to present or these have been? No, these have been presented before. Okay. At this time, is there anyone from the public that would like to speak regarding the proposed budgets for 2022, tax rates, tax levy, CPF plan, or bus replacement? not then we will recess the public hearing or adjourn excuse me the public hearing and we will let's see that was the public hearing for those items now we will open the public hearing for additional appropriations for a general obligation bond notice that this hearing was published in the Rochester Sentinel on August 24th do I have a motion to adopt the proof of publication so moved. motion by Kyle second 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 by Kyle Rinsberger. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Okay, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. The board will now hear all taxpayers desiring to be heard in respect to the matter of the additional appropriation in the amount of $995,000 plus investment earnings thereon. Taking a look at the additional appropriation resolution, we are being asked to adopt this resolution. Here, and then here are other copies of their others that would like to see those. appropriation resolution we are being asked to adopt this resolution which appropriates the proceeds of the general obligation bond of 2021 in the amount of $995,000 to the cost of the project which has not yet been defined do I have any taxpayers that wanted to talk about this resolution do I have a motion to adopt the additional appropriation resolution Motion by Katie. Second. Second by Tom McLaughlin. Any questions or comments from the board? All right. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. I will now ask for a motion that directs the secretary, Katie Miller, to advertise the sale of the bonds. Motion by Tom. Second. Second by Casey. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. I don't know. Motion carries 7 0. Yeah, we should vote for yourself in that, in that respect, right? It is I must have missed the meeting or something. I don't know that's 
It is important to note that the firm of Ice Miller Bond Council of Indianapolis has been consulted relative to the procedure to be followed in connection with the proposed bond issue and the rendering of an opinion approving the legality of the bonds. The board was then presented with a form of resolution for adoption for the purpose of authorizing the issuance of the bonds. Now looking at the final bond resolution, we are being asked to adopt this resolution which allows the issuance and sale of the general obligation bond of 2021 in the principal amount of $995,000 per the details as described herein. As a reminder, this does not contain a description of how the bond money will be spent. That discussion will come at a later time. Do I have a motion to adopt the final bond resolution? So moved. Motion by Casey, second? Second. Second by Kyle Rensberger. Any questions or comments from the board? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Finally, the board needs to consider and approve the post-issuance compliance procedures. This resolution amends and restates the original procedures to provide for a new compliance officer and to incorporate recent changes in law. We would be appointing our business manager, Todd Vanderbeek, Todd Vanderweel to serve as the compliance officer and direct that he implement these amended procedures. Do I have a motion to adopt the post issuance compliance procedures? So moved. Motion by Katie, second by Joe. Yeah. Any questions or comments from the board? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7 0. That concludes the public hearing. Do I have a motion to adjourn the public hearing? So moved. <laughs> motion by Kyle Rensberger. Second. Second by Casey. All those in favor? The meeting is adjourned by a vote of sevens. The public hearing is adjourned <laughs> about the geo okay. Now we're going to resume our regular board meeting, which I am more familiar with. <laughs> so, um, we are going uh, to item A under financial report, which is approval of claims. 19,753 to 19,889, totaling 813,803 dollars and 81 cents. Um, did, were there any questions or concerns from the board on those? Um, well also payrolls, we have two payrolls. Uh, August 27th, 2021, $427,935.16 and the September 10th, 2021 payroll for $462,856.66. Any questions or concerns from the board on those? Okay, Todd, would you go over the funds reports for us, please? I will. <coughs> uh, education fund in August, we have receipts of $1,047,065.32. Uh, expenses in August of $813,817.04. Uh, end of uh, August balance of $1,223,378.82. The debt service fund, we had receipts of $5,991.26. There were no expenses in August. Month end balance to the debt service fund of one million five hundred fifty seven thousand six hundred eighty one dollars and eighty five cents the operations fund we had receipts of fourteen thousand two hundred nine dollars eighty four cents uh, expenses in august of three hundred five thousand three hundred seven dollars and twenty cents our balance at the end of august in the operations fund is one million three hundred thirty eight thousand four hundred ninety three dollars and seven cents any questions or comments from the board? Okay, if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the claims, payrolls, and the funds report. So moved. Motion by Joe. Second. Second by Tom. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Next um, consent items, we have minutes of the August 16th, 2021 regular meeting, public hearing, minutes of the August 23rd, 2021 regular board meeting, and minutes of the September 7th, 2021 study session board and board meeting. There are two separate ones there. Any questions or concerns, comments by the board? 
not, I'll entertain a motion to approve all of those minutes and the consent items. So moved. Motion by Katie. Second. Second by Casey. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Okay. Then we have a third reading of policies, which would mean that these policies would be, if we read them and then vote to adopt them, would be adopted tonight. Those, um, all those numbers are listed there. They've been gone over multiple board meetings. Um, are there any concerns or comments from the board? If not, then I'll entertain a motion to approve these policies. policies. So moved. Motion by Casey. Second. Second by Kyle Rensberger. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries seven zero. Okay, we have a proposed increase to lifeguard pay uh, at the rate of ten dollars per hour. Anything else you want to say about that? Mm -hmm. That was part of a discussion and other pay raises that we did recently, and that brings us in line with um, other organizations and their pay rates for that. Any questions or comments from the board? If not, I'll entertain a motion to increase lifeguard pay to the rate of $10 per hour. So moved. Motion by Kyle Rensberger. Second. Second, Second by Tom. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Every year we have a tag or teacher appreciation grant policy that needs to be re-approved um, and so that happens tonight. So working with the uh, Teachers Association during um, discussions, we did talk about the tag grant and uh, I believe with Mrs. Shelley here, uh, both sides agreed that we would continue to distribute the tag grant funds as we have in the past which means that uh, we need to provide a 25% differential between highly effective and effective teachers. Teachers need to meet all of the compliance parts of the TAG grant, which means if they retired or resigned their position from last year, they would not qualify. If they're a first year teacher with Rochester schools, they would not qualify. Uh, they have to be present at the time or employed at the time that the funds uh, come in. And then uh, we distribute those out. Typically, um, Todd and Hope, you may need to help me a little bit. They typically come in uh, right around mid-November, just in time for us to issue those to teachers uh, right around Black Friday, which is great for everybody and, and uh, local businesses, I think. Um, but also in that, we have just a certain amount of time that we have to release the funds to teachers, so that would be part of this. And then we always issue those in a separate check. It's actually um, a hard check form. It is not direct deposited into teachers' accounts for various uh, reasons. Um, we learned in the past that for some teachers, if we do direct deposit, it triggers within their accounts uh, a house payment or a car payment or something coming out. And it, um, so we issue those in paper check forms and those go to the teachers as quickly as we can. And again, all of this will happen right around uh, November, uh, right around Thanksgiving. Any questions or comments from the board? Sure There's right. an option at the end of this. And I see, I just pulled the paperwork that you gave us last at the last meeting and it's on here too. Is that something that you're doing or? We, um, we don't choose that option. We don't differentiate any more than the 25% up above. Okay. Um, some schools will withhold some of the TAG grant funds and put that back into the educational fund and don't distribute the entire amount to teachers. Others provide a greater differentia differential than the 25% between highly effective and effective. And we've elected just to continue to keep the 25% differential. Okay. And it's not part of the base salary, which is another option we could choose, but we need exactly. to not. Yeah. Thank you. And all of this, for those who are new to the board, all of this is driven by uh, teacher evaluations. And then um, also the state has a funding formula and they let us know how much we get specifically for TAG grants. And we make sure that we are transparent with the teachers association and, and they see that figure, uh, that number as well. And then we work with them in regards to specifically what date we'll be able to issue those uh, paper checks to them. Any Hope, I don't know. I'm sorry. That's okay. I don't know if you have anything to add in regards mm -hmm. to that or. No. 
any other questions or comments from the board? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the tie grants. So moved. Motion by Katie. Second. Second by Joe. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Okay, consideration of co-ed volleyball club. So, um, and I've attached um, policies that uh, coincide with this, but we have a request uh, from the high school to begin a co-ed volleyball um, uh, uh, club, a group, and typically what, how this works is um, they're asking for one night per week and we would work with the different buildings. I know that sometimes during the winter months it's very hard to schedule events at the high school or middle school. Sometimes we do have the Riddle Gym or Columbia Gym that may be available for this, but um, normal IHSAA activities and athletics will supersede this. This will not displace any of those teams, but as available, we would like to open the gym for them to scrimmage. There are some schools uh, a year or two down the road, if we sustain, see sustainability, they're uh, beginning to compete with each other, so it may be a, a movement in that direction. But at this point in time, it's an activity to help build skills, um, to give students something uh, physical, uh, physical uh, uh, exercise to do and uh, to promote that within Rochester schools. How does this work, like if they're at Columbia or Riddle? as far as like um, you know access to the gym lights being turned on turned off mm -hmm. closing the building back up when they're done sure so when when these things happen when they schedule um, the building level principals and our maintenance team gets uh, schedules of events and so the custodians are responsible for opening up that gives the students and, and the sponsor access to the gym. And then afterwards, the, the evening custodians lock everything up, clean everything up, and we'll leave. But this is all done through assignments. Uh, and Kevin's nodding has had a lot of it runs through his office for gym availability first. If he says it's available athletically, it goes to the principal to make sure that there aren't any other uh, events scheduled for that evening, a choir concert, a band concert, those types of things. And then once it's approved there, it goes into our maintenance system and the head custodians track that and we'll sign up. I thought that's what it was. So basically like intramurals. Sure, absolutely. Do, do we have intramural basketball anymore? I mean, it used to be big before. Not at this time, we haven't had. Yeah. So trying to revive some of those things. And that would be subject to the availability of the gyms, et cetera, at the elementary, so it's not gonna bump any elementary Correct. programs. Right? Correct, okay. exactly. Will the students be required to have a physical? Yes. Any other questions about the volleyball club? If not, I'll entertain a motion to, um, in, let's say, to approve a co-ed volleyball club at the high school. So. Motion by Joe. Second. Second by Casey. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Then we have a proposed request for an exception to the Wednesday rule for National Junior Honor Society induction ceremony. Um, so we do have a policy where grades uh, K through, or pre-K through eighth grade, we uh, reserve Wednesday night as family night. Uh, there are times when we can't fit in every event and activity when we look at fine arts and the use of gymnasium. So Misty Cripe is the NJHS uh, sponsor, reached out to me and they're having a difficult time uh, scheduling this around athletics and some fine arts programs. Many of the students that would be involved in NJHS are also part of those other activities and then we're also concerned about availability of um, a, a point of access for students to have the induction ceremony. So she is requesting that Wednesday, September 29th at six o'clock, the ceremony should last approximately an hour I'm asking that the board um, lift that policy for that evening for the induction ceremony. Any questions or comments from the board? If not, I'll entertain a motion to grant the request to um, have an exception to the Wednesday rule for the National Junior Honor Society induction ceremony. So moved. Motion by Katie. Second. Second by Casey. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. All 
allowance to use March 9th, 2022 as a date for a band concert. So exactly uh, the same conversation as before, just having trouble scheduling and making sure we have the venue for that and then making sure we don't cross over with the athletic events so every student has the opportunity to participate. Looking at that, uh, the band, they're proposing a March 9th uh, evening concert on a Wednesday evening. So that's a Wednesday as well. Correct. I appreciate you looking, um, your teachers and administrators looking for options other than the weekends, because I do know at times the fine arts have been pushed even to weekends in the spring. And so I appreciate that this is a Wednesday instead. Any questions or comments from the board? not I will entertain a motion to grant an exception for the Wednesday night rule for the band concert on March 9th. So moved. Motion by Tom. Second. Second by Kyle Rensberger. Any further discussion? All those in favor please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Okay Mrs. Vance update on COVID. So I want to think back, and I know that uh, Nurse Butler is here as well uh, for the data that they've been providing. So I have some data prior to um, the policy, which uh, talked about the mask mandate, and I'll read some of that data to you. And then also uh, want to clarify some points within the policy that have been brought to our attention and make sure that we discuss that. So again, with two of our nurses here, I think through the two that are here. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. I know that at times it feels and seems overwhelming and wanna, wanna publicly thank you for the work that you're doing. So from August 3rd to September 8th, here are uh, some data points for consideration. Rochester High School at that time had had, from during that time period, 12 different uh, staff members who were quarantined. During that time period, 175 students had been quarantined. We had three total positive staff cases, 15 total positive student cases. Prior to September 8th at Rochester Middle School, we had eight total quarantined staff members, 139 total quarantined students, we had two staff members from Rochester Middle School who had tested positive, and 11 total positive students during that time. At Riddle, uh, we had 14 total quarantine staff members. 185 students had been quarantined during that time period. Was that 185 total students at Riddle had been quarantined during that time. One positive staff member during that time frame and 15 total positive students. At Columbia from August 8th to, or I'm sorry, August 3rd to September 8th, we had 33 total quarantine staff members 226 total quarantine students, three total positive staff members. Did you say 12? Three. Three. Yeah. And 18 total positive students at Columbia during that time period. Working with Beth today, um, and I'm thankful that both Beth and Nurse Butler are here because the data seems far different uh, now, but uh, I did ask them to go back and Beth did some data tracking in regards to specific to school, because one of the things that has happened is we've had Labor Day activities, and I think both ladies will shake their head that a lot of this is happening outside of school, so I asked them to track specific to in-school data. So at the high school, right now we have 18 positive students Six positive staff members. Two of those six are part of the maintenance team at the high school. Sixty-eight students are quarantined at the high school. Seventeen of those related to uh, the football team. 
The rest are related to household close contacts and one quarantine staff member. At the middle school right now, we have 11 students who have tested positive, one staff member who has tested positive, 54 students who were quarantined, zero happened within the school. They were all events that happened outside of Rochester Middle School that caused them to be quarantined. Riddle, we have three students who are currently positive, one staff member who is currently positive, 26 students who were quarantined, zero were quarantined through the school but were household or outside of school contacts. So it's six. 26 quarantine. So there weren't any staff that were quarantined at the middle school? No, not at this time, not since the policy's been adopted, nor at Riddle. Columbia, we have three students who are positive, two staff who are positive, two staff who are quarantined, 29 students who are currently quarantined. Of those 29, only five were close contacts within the building. The rest were outside incidents, household incidents. We also have one uh, instructional assistant from our transportation department or one IA that rides buses who is currently positive as well. And I'm sorry, can you tell me Again, with the high school and how many of those students that are quarantined were from the school. I know um, said so many with the football team, but then six, 68 students total are quarantined. Mm -hmm. 17 of those are from the football team. The remainder are household contacts. This data does not include, I don't believe, the closing of Rochester Middle School's volleyball team happened after this data was submitted to me. Yeah. 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 So that number would add to the number of students who were quarantined okay. this afternoon. That's 13 in the middle school. Thank you. So 13. So that makes a number at the middle school 67 quarantined. Of those, 54 happened outside of the school district. The remainder were the volleyball team we had to quarantine this afternoon. So it's 13 middle school volleyballers mm -hmm. add, added on to the 11 we already have there. That's an RMS. Oh, positive students, 54, got it, sorry, I'll get 54 it. 54 were quarantined, yeah. And then at Riddle, how many of the quarantine and the 26 were? 26 school? are quarantined, zero are in school contacts. I didn't write anything there, I didn't want to make sure I was. Sure, sure. Right. <laughs> so I appreciate the ladies and the data tracking they're, they're doing. Um, and especially appreciate the last minute request for those that could be tracked in school and those that are happening outside. I did, uh, Beth and I did contact Dr. Rayburn mid morning this morning and we talked a lot about this and the numbers, um, seeing some of the highest numbers of positive cases throughout the district that we've seen at any one point. He continued to encourage us to, con to keep schools open as long as we can, um, knowing that we would have to shut down teams or classrooms uh, and just continue to uh, do the absolute best we can. Uh, also encouraging the community and staff or community and, and business community parents to help us out with these numbers. <laughs> um, one of the concerns within the policy that has come up that um, was brought to my attention midweek last week um, and I've got copies for everybody here some extra copies these are copies of the policy adopted at the yep. last meeting yep exactly but want to draw some attention to a couple of areas that the nurses are finding mm -hmm. problematic mm -hmm. that's the policy yeah. that I adopted that's at the last that's meeting that's but that's Jana's that's going to reference it so she can get copies of it 29 quarantines at Columbia right now. How are we quarantined? Is this because this was prior to the mask mandate? No, these are students who it, the quarantining happened because of outside of school events. So parent tested positive, grandparent tested positive. They were at a, 
uh, function where somebody at that function tested positive. It did not happen within the four walls of the school. But well, you said five were from the building. Five of the 29 are ours. I think that's what. Oh, I'm sorry. So are they, those five, happened like, they from before? Yeah, or? it's either like lunch or like things they couldn't, know, they couldn't have been masked at, so. And Sam's nodding her head. I yeah. think a lot of they, them they were from lunch. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the concerns that uh, the nursing staff brought to me, and again, I appreciate Beth is in my office every day having uh, honest, open conversations about the concerns that they're having. One of the confusions within the policy, um, I'm going to kind of jump forward, then I'm going to bring it back on page three at the top. Letter B mentions face covering or shield. Letter D on page three mentions face coverings and face shields. If we could go back now to some confusion that this has caused with teachers who are trying to follow this as well as nurses who are pulling this up on page two. I would respectfully say under letter B that we need to clarify and have it say mask or face shields there. I would say on page three, the very top line, it is required that all students and staff wear mask or face shields there. And especially on number four, page four, letter I, that it says uh, for a person who's not wearing a mask or face shield due to an exemption and that we keep that language uh, clean and consistent uh, that has been a point of concern across the district and clarification and following the policy so is your recommendation to your recommendation is to add face shield not to strike correct face shield correct. correct where was that on the first on page two Janet on page two it was under Roman numeral two letter B thank you mask for face shields and that the most important part of this would be at the top of page four when we're talking about uh, the classroom settings and those types of things and, and quarantining. So top of page four, letter I that we add or facial there is the most important. But for the language, for clarification, for teachers who are trying to help the nurses communicating with parents, uh, I feel that it's important that we clean that uh, language up across across the policy. And on page three, was that G? Any person um, wearing face covering or face covering? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. so oh yes, top. three. Yes, thank you, Casey. G as well. So on page three, it would be in the opening line. And then uh, on letter G. I don't think we need a G. Face, face covering. Face covering. Um, face covering. It says face cover. Then we should be okay. That should be okay. But I think that that uh, has. Oh, I see what you're saying though, because otherwhere on that other what other places on that same page, it does say face coverings and face shields. Mm -hmm. I would say face coverings face are a face shield. Can be, but I see. So yes, to remain consistent, that makes sense to add it. <clears throat> so I know that that's a change in policy, and that came out of conversations with nurses and teachers and. Uh, will help with the consistency part there. So I don't know if that takes board approval to change that policy. Oh, that would be, be amending the policy. Are there any questions from the board about adding face shield to make it clear that that is a, is a viable option to a face mask? Absolutely. Yes. Is there going to be any other um, amendments to the policy that you're going to ask for? Not on, not on our side that we Okay, see. so let's go ahead and um, we feel comfortable voting on amending the policy to add face shield on those parts that Mrs. Vance read or to be consistent that a mask means also a face shield. Do I have recommendation to amend the policy so moved. recommendation by Kyle or yes moved by Kyle Mack second second by Casey any other questions on the board 
All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries seven zero. Any other COVID updates that you? I don't have any. I know that the team is here um, and hope from the Teachers Association if there is, are any points of discussion. Um, I know that they have been working hard. I know that Beth meets regularly with the team um, to keep them consistent and to make sure that the communication is the same. And I want to thank them again for that. I am wondering why this information that was stable to that, this is the July 26th information? Where do you Oh, yeah. Because the state has September 7th updated information, and this doesn't have the other two options. The 8 and 10 day, this is only the 10 day. So I think that Beth and uh, Kevin can help answer those questions as well in regards to the number, the quarantine. Is that the question? No, I'm wondering why this is old information with state building policy. That I printed out all of the information. So we adopt this. Was this originally attached to our policy, though? No, this no. is the first time I've ever seen no. this. Okay. And I've spent hours on the Indiana Department of Health website. So, what what are those dated? So these are July twenty sixth, and I know they've got September seventh and September third. They have the same quarantine decision tree that has the eight. 10 and 14 options, just very simply one, two, and three. That's what I emailed everybody tonight with the Department of Health's actual rules, not guidelines, but their actual rules on um, you know all of that stuff that was said. So are you asking if that's the decision tree that they are using at this point? Is the September 7th one? I would hope it would be. Yeah, absolutely. It's okay. I mean, I, I'm just yeah. wondering why this was stapled to the policy. Well, I think part of the concern that is coming out of this is on the athletic end in regards to what we need to follow athletically and the guidance there. And so in, in our policy, it shares specifically that um, the policy does not pertain to athletics mm -hmm or other strategic, other uh, areas where it is difficult. So band, choir, those types of things. So in that, one of the discussions, and Kevin and uh, Beth helped me out here, is the discussion around the wearing of masks when students return and whether or not that allows them to participate athletically. Correct? Right. The policy applies to athletes. The exemption for quarantining does not apply to those extracurricular activities. Right. And I guess the way that I would see the practice, you know, when you if you choose the eight-day option, a seven-day option, you know, the Department of Health has in their rules that you come back and you take your precautions. So you're masked, you stay six feet away, and um, Nothing in the policy differentiates between athletics or just regular classroom time or walking down the hallway, except for that quarantine exemption, which the state says athletes can't have it, band can't have it, choir can't have it. So that's in there. Um, but nothing else talks about it. Mm -hmm. But the state, the actual rules from the Department of Health say, you know, when you come back on day eight, if you've gone and you've got your negative test on day five, and you come back on day eight, then you, you know, take the precautions. You check your symptoms, you mask up, you stay six feet away. Unless the county health officer or the state say something different. And nowhere else in the Department of Health rules does it talk about differentiating athletes from anything except for the exemption to the quarantine. So as far as the practice and how that would go about I guess how I feel would be that would be a conversation needed to be had with Dr. Rayburn and have him give a directive on, you know, do they go back to practice? Do they just stay six feet away? Do they wear a gaiter? Do they, I mean, because we don't differentiate between masking except for when you're the asymptomatic and you have to wear, you know, surgical mask. So if they wore a gaiter and they were six feet away from everybody, is that okay? 
Well, yeah. I think if they are close contact, we agree that they would be wearing this type of mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does the IHSA mandate, though? It that, does, that's the catch. It does, it does say on the ISDH that um, actually the changes do not apply for athletics when it's talking about um, the changes above as far as COVID-19 guidance, asymptomatic close contact. So um, they do still recommend the 14-day quarantine for athletics in the CDC. But we didn't adopt the IHSAA's recommendation. Well, hold on. The IHSA is not going to mandate. No, yeah. they, they refer you to the ISDH. What did she just reference? Though? What did you reference? CD, uh, ISDH guidance. Yeah, it says it in two of the different documents. Because the CDC too. did not make our policy. The ISDH no, ISDH is Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The CDC is not in there. Yeah. Okay. So you have two documents from the Department of Health that talk about athletes being quarantined for 14 days yes. as a requirement. No, as a guideline. As a guideline, so it is yeah. not a requirement. It's not in our policy. Well, everything is a guideline from the ISDH. There's very few things that are actually. We have a lot of. No, they have very clear IAC rules. Well, that's what we are mandated to follow. Right. Not guidelines or recommendations. So I mean, I guess if the board wants that in the policy, right. I'm just saying, this is worthless if we don't enforce what's in here. We don't take our own opinions and say, this is what I like out of the CDC, this is what I like out of here, this is what I like out of here, and I'm going to enforce that. We need to put it in here and have a reason to put it in there. And then that's what everybody enforces so that it's, it doesn't come back, it's not confusing to the public, it's not confusing to the kids or the parents, we have one policy, it's on our website, this is just it. And that's all I'm saying. I mean, if the board wants to do the 14 days, fine, let's vote on it, great, amend it, okay. But let's amend it, let's put it in here. I think another concern that, that came up in these conversations that we've all received information from at least, you know, a couple of parents in the last couple of weeks, but, um, you know, if they get a, a negative COVID test and can come back on day eight, mm -hmm. then are they excluded from practice until day 14? Yes. Yeah. According to what, like that, what you just and According to the ISH. And the other part of that is too, they say that they don't want you to do athletics unless you can mask and you can completely right. distant and the mask is no exceptions right. from the state. That's the guideline. Well, what Casey's saying, the recommendations yeah. there, what Casey's saying, saying that either needs to be put in the policy or, in, or, I mean, or we can't, we just can't keep accepting recommendations from these credible sources that you're using you would have and changing the rules as we go. Well, and I, I think that the issue is, I had a parent who came to me with, I saw this on the CDC, I saw this on the Indiana Department of Health, I saw this on your website, and I saw this in the IHSAA, which one are you following? And I go, we go with the Indiana Department of Health. Yeah. That was my response. But the IHSAA says this, uh, we go with the Indiana Department of Health. I think they were looking, perhaps, you know, looking yeah. for a loophole in a sense, and not, I mean, I agree parents want their kids back in school, and I don't disagree with that. I mean, everybody wants their kid back as soon as they can be, but we also need to, but as part of our policy, we're following the ISBA. And if that's what it says, then we need to make sure that that's clear. And even, you know, even if we have to spell out athletics, mm -hmm. whether you're a seventh grade volleyball player or a high school footballer, this well, that's, is how we That's manage. exactly what I think we need to do because you gotta look at like football, for example. If you're shut down for a period of time and you come back on a Tuesday, let's say they all come back, is that enough time to truly get them back in decent shape to be able to play on Friday night where that's a health and safety concern in my opinion. You're off for eight to ten days, you come back on a Tuesday, you practice two to three days, t technically two, then you have a walkthrough, and then you go out and play a game. That's not the same as going out and playing a volleyball match. It's, it's a whole different it's a whole different spectrum. But but I get I get what you're saying as well because I've had the same or I shouldn't say the same individuals, but many individuals say to me, what are you following? I mean under the moon, you guys, you know, and and our nurses, 
are also pulling information on, on a weekly basis or daily basis, whatever that may be, and they're pulling from information. You know, we're, we develop a policy that doesn't include the CDC, but we're still referencing CDC stuff. It, it's too much. We follow so do I, the ISDH, and a lot of times they reference the CDC. So when we reference that, that's from the ISDH. So. so do I have a motion to amend the policy under uh, Roman numeral 9, return after exhibiting symptoms, to add a paragraph D that would specify that would be on page six. A paragraph D that would specify um, that we will follow ISDH guidelines for returning um, to the athletic field, since there isn't a specific return about athletics listed in here, that we would add that. I don't even know where that's at. I mean, honestly, I'd love to see it, because I've read the rules. It's not in there. I mean, it may be one of their recommendations, but it's not in their rules. So I'm adding, I'm asking if we have a motion to add that we would follow their guidelines. I want to read the guidelines before we would vote on it, though, because none of us have ever had that. I mean, there's lots of different Is there guidelines. Is there a link that we could pull up to look at it? Or? Yeah, if you just go on ISDH um, website. Could, would you mind, Beth, helping Scott find that on the... Um, she has no faith in you, Mr. Kissler. Come on, now. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he can. I just knew that Beth had recently seen it. So. Well, but if you go on the IH, ISDH website, I mean, it really is. It's a, it's an onion where you just continue to peel more and more layers. So but, and, and right. but that's why we have the trained personnel who have the training go weekly that she, that Beth would know then where that is. You go to all the way on the right I guess technically we're mm -hmm. back so, eligible tomorrow with negative tests, but still. Well, and part of it is the 14 within the policy. Within the policy on page 5, it talks about under Roman numeral 8, number 4, that they would wear a surgical mask for 14 days, even if they come back. And I think the other concern from athletics is putting a surgical mask on students that have been in close contact and putting them under a helmet and putting them out on the field. But our policy says you don't wear a mask during athletics. It only says during school or classroom. It doesn't say athletics. Right. And that's where the IS, the actual Indiana Department of Health, what I sent everybody before the meeting and underlined where it said your county health officer can make a determination. That's where it'd be nice to see what Dr. Rayburn actually said. Because you have different different sports. This is athletes. This is athletics. This is all athletics. You know, and so if I'm running track, obviously wearing a mask is going to be extremely difficult. <laughs> you know, but if I'm throwing, I don't know, I'm not a track person, but if I'm doing something that where I'm not doing that cardio, you know, it would just be nice to have. This is why I asked for the COVID update to be on every two weeks because stuff's always changing. It's important that we follow the policy as is and not amend it. Personal people amending it as we go along or adding stuff. We strictly need to follow the policy and we need to make sure we're we get clarifying it. as we go along. Yeah, we get it find it. yeah, it's all of it's right there. That's all the guidance from the ISDH for school. Okay. So, so where's the athletic? Oh, okay. 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 I know. I read all of that. Okay. So here it talks about the changes in definition apply only apply to students in K in grades K through 12 for the academic school day while in the classroom. And then below it says these changes do not apply in high risk classes. Changes do not apply for athletics, including cheerleading or other extracurricular activities. But that's the 824. Yeah. They actually reissued that in September. Well, we can go to the the 97. They're both on here. Um, 
that's guidance for masks in school. Is that what you're? September 2nd one. That's where they updated the quarantine. Second, and then they had the mask on September 2nd, and then right. September 7th, I just pulled two new ones. Um, I'm not sure what the difference was. Yeah, if you want to click on guidance for masks and school, go ahead and click on that. Yeah, just click on the bottom. I don't see a second one there. I see a third, September 3rd, but I don't mm -hmm. see a second one. And that might be how they dated it. It's just on yeah, the, on the, the form. It's yeah. I mean, that's the that's the updated guidance there. That's updated every Thursday. Until that's it might have been from like a webinar, and sometimes they have to look at there for you. Then. What the webinar? Okay, I think it was on there. Yeah, probably a webinar is what it's from. Because that would have been, did you say 92? Yeah, that would have been on Thursday. Yeah. Let's see here. This is the Yeah, it's dated at 93. to amend to follow the Indiana State Department of Health guidelines for athletics. If so, we can move forward. If not, then this topic would be a study session topic and if there would be further discussion and want to amend at the next meeting, we could. But that's... I, I still don't see anything for athletics, though. The Nurse Butler and Nurse Dave Dahl just said it was through a webinar. So there's no use well, amending it to a webinar. We don't have that information. The guidelines that were set by the ISDH that were shared with them at a webinar. Well, that's it right there. But, but this was just like, for, huh? Are you saying that's the most recent for athletics? Yeah. It doesn't say listen. athletics, though. It says it in the Great document. Time. It does not say that they are recommending at anybody who is quarantined as a close contact in athletics okay. to be quarantined for 14 days. Yeah. All it says is the same thing that we did when we passed our policy. Wear masks at all times. But isn't that if they're not masked in the classroom, then that would be the 14 days? No, I'm sorry. So if you have close contacts even at home, if people are not wearing masks, mm -hmm. isn't the quarantine period for 14 days? Right, and then you have the 10 day option with any of its precautions and the eight day with the right. testing and its precautions. Everybody so across the board has the three options. It doesn't matter if it was athletes, athletics, or in the classroom, bunch room, taking your mask off. Everybody has the three options. Eight, 10, 14. What I'm saying is there, I want to see and read where the Department of Health is actually saying it is their new rule that if you are an athlete, you have to quarantine for 14 days. The sheet for July 26 states, if distance of at least six feet away from others during practice, participation, or while observing cannot be maintained, students should not practice, compete, or attend the activities until after 14 days quarantine. I guess that's where that originally comes from. Yeah, that's from July. That's from July, though, so, so I don't know the, what's happened since then. I have the guidance from 93 from the state. It's from our webinar, but it's from 
and it's on here, the ISDH, I can send it to you, but it's talking about it, it says, does this change anything for extracurricular activities? No, this change only applies to indoor classroom setting. Extracurricular activities should be contact traced as described by CDC. So, I can send that to you. But that still does not say that an athlete has to be quarantined for 14 days and doesn't have the eight or 10 day option. Do you mean to come back for school or to come back athletically? Jenny's talking about amending the quarantine guidelines. I would, that's not practice. I, that's no, not activities. That's quarantining. No, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I meant for, I think it's pretty clear for coming back to the classroom. Right. But yeah. as far as returning to practice is what I thought you were asking about. If you were, because what I'm hearing here is that they can't return to practice until 14 days. And, and I may have misinterpreted. What I was hearing from you is, well, don't they have the eight or the 10 day option to return to practice as well? I would think that any student, athlete or not, is treated the same as far as the classroom goes, but returning to practice is a different animal, or potentially is a different animal. Right. And I see I'm looking at it as two different things. Number one, they're no different than any other student, whether it's athletes or not. They as far get as the, the three options as far as quarantine, right. 8, 10, 12, right. or 14. But as far as stating, okay, they can or can't resume that activity, that's not listed on here well, anywhere. Well, if they, like what Kevin and I have talked about, I mean, if they could safely do it with what they say, I mean, you're masked at all times in your distance, like you're supposed to during hands for breath. But like, what we talked about, I mean, there's very few things. I mean, we even considered that with football. <coughs> you know, what could we possibly do to get them a practice in that it's not feasible? So what they would just do is if they, if they got tested and they were negative, they come back to school, masked, in distance on day eight, which is going to be tomorrow. And it, if it was possible to practice in that same very, in that very same manner, they could do it. If they don't get a test, they come back to school on Friday. Still mask in distance. If they can practice that way, they can do it. Then they come back on Monday, which is the 14th day. So the quarantining, if you have a negative test, stops at day eight. So they don't, they don't have to quarantine. We'll have, there will be guys, football guys that got tested this weekend that'll be at school tomorrow. Sure. So that's when the quarantining stops. But as far as practicing unencumbered regular athletic activities without a mask and without, I mean, you can't distance when you practice football, but that won't happen until the 14th day. So they won't be practicing. They could if 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 they, had an if they if you can by the nature of the sport if you could do it if he could if Coach Schaefer could have practice tomorrow with the guys that are there and have a mask and keep them distance to which he said you can't do it but if you could do it they could do it so if it's in a sport that is able to do that however that would be mm -hmm. they could do that mm -hmm. but it, so our guidelines and that's are my point I don't want to put it in there. Because there are some sports, there's the weight room. I mean, you know, the football players could go into the weight room and they could work on that part of it. I mean, if we have it in the policy, is somebody going to see them in the weight room, that's six that's feet apart from a teammate, and say, they're hey, they're, they're doing they're not wearing what they're not supposed to? You know, I mean, I don't want to take that away from them. If they can wear a mask and, you know, bench press. Okay, so, so do, are we clear then that our policy is... <laughs> is sufficient in saying the quarantining guidelines as is, as we have right now, and that we know that that applies to whatever activities they're doing, they need to stay distanced. And if their extracurricular activities are something where they can't stay distanced, then they have to wait 14 days to resume that activity. They can come back to school sooner, but. Our that's policy what the, doesn't say that though. Our policy has the returning after exhibiting symptoms. It says you gotta wear a mask for 14 days even if you return on day eight in school Correct. for all activities. Now if you if it doesn't say for all activities, then maybe those three words is what we need to add. And then it's up to the coaches and the AD to say, look, you know, obviously you're not gonna go out and run, you know, a 50 yard dash with a mask on. 90 degree heat. You know, you're just not gonna do it. But you can go in the weight room if you want to go in the weight room, do squats. Okay, so that sounded like that was more of a necessary discussion rather than needing to amend, that we're clear that 
those three options exist for any student, but it all, all of those thresholds need to be met to resume the activities in question. Is that webinar, is that something to be printed out or is that like a link? Yeah, I can send it to you. So why did, well, that webinar is in the Indiana Department of Health, they, and you said the last thing you read is they referenced the CDC. Mm -hmm. So any other questions about COVID? I want to thank you, Beth and Sam, and all of your um, colleagues. Yeah, I, Mrs. Shelley, like, it is giving us a few. So much. You are literally on the front lines and you have been incredibly professional and dedicated and our students and staff are so blessed to have you and we are thankful for what you do in a very difficult situation. A situation we were hopeful would be different at this point but you um, keep moving forward and we are so very I'd like to say thank you. I know a lot of times when I talk about this, it sounds harsh, but my biggest thing is consistency. And I have heard over and over and over again in the last 10 days that it's not a consistent message between the four buildings. So I would like to ask that the message is cleaned up. Everybody has the exact same fact sheet, like the 9-3 fact sheets. It's the, it's the most you know, the absolute most current you know we're not pulling stuff from July we're not pulling stuff from June I don't know how many times people have sent me policies from other schools and said hey look they're not doing what you're doing and I take two seconds I look at it and I'm like I'm sorry sweetie this is from June everything changed in August you know everything changed in, in September I'd like to ask that that message is cleaned up and that it's consistent and anybody emailing a parent of a close contact Anybody emailing anybody or talking to them on the phone is reading that same information and it's it's either the policy, it's either the, the Department of Health's rules, actual rules, or it's their fact sheets. I mean those fact sheets are cartoons, you just have one up. I mean they were they're perfect, you know, to explain things very simply. I would like to ask that, you know, of everybody involved in discussing things with the community with with this. It just makes the difficult situation even more difficult when misinformation is given because too many people are talking, there's no consistent message. You know, I would just ask that. I do appreciate everything you guys are doing. I know it's difficult, I know it's hard. I know it's frustrating because it's frustrating for me to listen to all of it, but please find that consistent message. Whatever we can do to assist in that, just like the, with the face shields bringing any of those to our attention that we can clarify is helpful. Um, donations. Sayo mm -hmm. Zai, $50 to middle school reading plus program. Farm credit, Miranda Shrove, three garbage bags of Hot Wheel cars to Columbia. Kristen Gentry, $8 for Columbia student use. Fulton County Solid Waste District, $300 to Columbia for reward for recycling efforts. First Christian Church, $2,000 for the backpack program. The Blackboard Giving Fund, $8 for corporation student use. And the Blackboard Giving Fund, $4 for corporation student use. Any tip? <coughs> Thank you to our donors. We appreciate the incredible <coughs> support that we have from the community. And um, I love to see something like this where from a large monetary donation down to small, they are all impactful and important to me. Can make a comment? I, I saw the three bags of Hot Wheel cars. They, they were all brand new in the package. It's unbelievable how many they had there. Oh, I mean, it's not like old cars. Uh -huh. That's kind of neat that they had that many. Awesome. <laughs> Is that for indoor recess? <laughs> or are they going to use them on the slides? That's what my favorite is. <laughs> that sounds like a science experiment. Oh, uh, we do, as a board, need to though, approve donations. So do I have a motion to approve these donations? So moved. Motion by Joe? Second. Second by Tom. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Okay, we have a lengthy personnel report, and there had been um, a couple of changes that had happened, so if, I think I got, I did it off yes. this afternoon yes. at three, so. <laughs> um, 
high rate of Patty Halford, night custodian at Columbia, an hourly rate of $13.14. Priscilla Nelson, high school food service assistant, an hourly rate of $12. Jade Lynn Calvert, middle special needs instruction assistant, hourly rate $12. Elena Deshawn, middle school instructional assistant, hourly rate $12. Emily Holt, middle school instructional assistant, hourly rate $12. Savannah Stevens, middle school instructional assistant, hourly rate $12. Mary Ryder, Columbia instructional assistant, hourly rate $12. Olivia Medina, maternity leave sub for middle second grade, daily rate of $140. Santha Evie, case conference coordinator for special education, hourly rate of $14.26. Laura Kay, middle school food service assistant, hourly rate of $14.87. Wendy Sutton, Columbia Food Service Assistant, hourly rate of $13.14. Amy Widman, Middle School Instructional Assistant, hourly rate of $12. And Madison Selzinski, Middle Special Needs Instructional Assistant, hourly rate of $12. In reassignment, Mallory Benzing, RHS Technology Coordinator to RHS Media Specialist Technology Aid, hourly rate of $12. Marsha Warland, RMS Creative Writing Grammar to RMS Facts, effective October 18, 2021. Her salary will remain the same. Changes, changes in contract, Sarah Warner Wilson, grade six special education substitute teacher to a regular teacher contract at the salary of $34,600. Retirement of Julie Calvert, deputy treasurer, her last day, September 17th, 2021, her retirement effective October 1st, 2021. Resignation of Carrie Nelson, middle food service effective, August 27th, 2021. Brandy Lewis as the Compliance Coordinator, effective October 6th, 2021. Emily Elliott, Columbia Preschool Instructional Assistant, effective September 9th, 2021. Angela Lunau, Middle School Instructional Assistant, effective September 10th, 2021. Kaylin Ranstead, Middle Family and Consumer Science Teacher, effective October 6th, 2021. Termination of Jennifer Helder, RMS Food Service, effective August 18th, 2021. ECA recommendation, Brittany Piercy, High School Drama Director, with a combined director and assistant director stipends of $3,403. Athletic resignation, Phil Bowers, RMS 7th grade girls basketball coach. Athletic hires, Bryce Abbott, middle school football coach, stipend of $1,300. Fall intercession, that these will be paid at the hourly rate, Jara Pio uh, at the middle school, Bryce Roberts at the middle school, and Joanna Tewalt at the middle school as an instructional assistant. Reassignment, Veronica Mendez, Riddle Special Needs Instructional Assistant to Title I Instructional Assistant. Fall intercession paid at the hourly rate at the high school, Ken Hughes, Jamie Kirkwood, Lucy Hernandez, and Deb Wolford. Athletics, Matt Steininger, Boys Assistant Varsity Swim Coach for the 2021-22 swim season, the pay rate of $1,184. And Phil Bowers, the junior girls junior varsity basketball coach for 2021-2022 basketball season, pay rate of $3,770. Hires Ariana Heishman as a one-to-one -one special needs instructional assistant at Columbia for an hourly rate of $12.59. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel report? <coughs> so moved. Motion by Katie? Second. Second by Casey. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. And that leads us to superintendent business. The, the one thing I'd like to share is clarification around uh, CARES money and with Todd here and with Mrs. Shelley here as <clears throat> part of our CTA. There's a lot of miscommunication and I feel even a lot of phone calls that are receiving CARES money is linked to uh, the specific mask mandate. I want to make sure that everybody realizes that that is not true. The CARES money was originally brought about for school districts. The first round was during the time of COVID when we really needed those funds to be able to purchase the mask, do the deep cleaning, the disinfecting, those types of things. Round two was when it uh, continued and uh, we were looking at uh, the substitute teachers that were needed, the continued cleaning, the overtime in our transportation department those types of things. This third round was very specific for schools who had not opened at that point in time. Uh, they made it very clear that they wanted those funds to go towards uh, the reopening of schools to be able to do it safely. So they put aside that money specifically for things like HVAC, for uh, specific remediation, for um, student growth and achievement due to uh, some learning um, 
gaps that had happened during the COVID time in order to receive the CARES money back in July with the original reopening plan, we qualified for CARES money at that point in time. It has nothing to do with the most recent update. The CARES money does not arrive in Rochester schools in any of our accounts. It wasn't reflected on anything that you've seen here. And we have to be very transparent and go through the auditing process. It is a reimbursement uh, type of revolving account. And we have to, first of all, uh, set, uh, make sure that those reimbursements qualify for the funds. Those have to be submitted and then we are reimbursed for that. So just as a, a clarification across the community and trying to resolve some of those telephone calls, it has nothing to do with the latest uh, implementation of mask mandate uh, per the governor's executive order. Anything else? No, I wanna thank everybody. I know um, the administrative team talks about it a lot. Hope talks about it a lot. Um, just how emotionally draining it is for, for everybody. And we just ask for everybody's continued patience and support. What we're doing within the school seems to be working. Uh, speaking with Dr. Rayburn today, he says we're still a couple weeks out uh, in regards to this peaking in Fulton County, and it's going to take everybody working together to get over that final hurdle. Thank you. And with that, we'll turn to Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you.